The personal stories expressed in this series reflect the true experiences and opinions of the guests and may not represent the official position of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles has said, There is hope for the addicted, and this hope comes through the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ and by humbling oneself before God, pleading to be freed of the bondage of addiction and offering our whole soul to Him in fervent prayer. Priesthood leaders can help as those who have addiction seek counsel from them. Where necessary, they can refer them to qualified licensed counselors and LDS Family Services. The Addiction Recovery Program adapted from the original 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous is readily available through LDS Family Services. In this series, you will hear actual meetings discussing each of the gospel principles of addiction recovery and healing. Addiction recovery meetings have strict guidelines of confidentiality and anonymity. These podcasts may seem contradictory to such standards. All the participants in these meetings are active participants in the Addiction Recovery Program and have willingly volunteered to participate. Their experiences are genuine and not fabricated. These recordings were created with the express purpose of providing a way for individuals who are isolated from recovery groups to participate, as well as provide an example to church leaders and members of a typical meeting. Today's meeting will discuss Step 8, Seeking Forgiveness. Welcome to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Addiction Recovery Meeting. I am Elder Ennis, and I am serving as the missionary group leader this evening. Uh, We do not have any new faces, but we are missing a couple of the regulars. So, as always, we're going to go around the room, and we will start at my left with Robert. And if you could just introduce yourselves. My name is Robert, and I'm an addict, alcoholic. Hey, Robert. Robert. My name is Scott, and I'm a recovering addict and alcoholic. Hey, Scott. Hi, Scott. Yeah. I'm Abra. I'm a recovering addict. Hey, Hi, Abra. Abra. I'm Lindsay. I'm an addict alcoholic. Hi, Hi Lindsay. Lindsay. I'm Karen. I'm a recovering drug addict. Hi, Hi Karen. Karen. My name is Rich, and I'm a child of God. Hi, Rich. Hi, I'm Scott, and I'm recovering from an addiction to pornography. Hi, Scott. Hi, Scott. Hi, Scott. My name is Dub, and I have multiple allergies. Hey, uh, my name's Steve, addict alcoholic. Hi, Steve. Hi. I would like to remind everybody to turn off your cell phones and pagers. We do not have any announcements for this meeting, so could somebody please volunteer and offer us an opening prayer? I could do that. Thanks, Doug. Mm-hmm. Our kind, loving, eternal wise Father in heaven, as we a few brothers and sisters in the gospel and friends of Bill W. and Dr. Bob gather here at this LDS 12-step meeting, Father. We are so grateful for the work that the brethren have done to bring these 12-step recovery meetings into the house of the Lord where we might hear the still small voice of the Holy Ghost and even feel the embrace of our Lord and Master, thy Son, Jesus Christ. Father, bless us this night that we may all have a desire to be honest and share those honest things from deep within our soul, that we might continue our baby steps of recovery. For we know that it is through these meetings and the atonement of our brother Jesus Christ, that a spiritual awakening can happen and will happen. And we acknowledge thy hand in all the powers of this great program, Father, and do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. As always, we like to begin with the church's mission statement, and that is, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Addiction Recovery Meetings assist those who desire to recover from addiction. We also welcome family and friends whose lives may be affected by the addiction of another. We are a group of brothers and sisters who share our experience, faith, and hope as we study and apply the principles of the gospel as they correlate with the 12 steps of recovery. 
our meetings provide a safe place for honest sharing because we adhere to the principles of confidentiality and anonymity, and we use appropriate language and behavior to invite the Spirit to be with us. As we practice these 12 steps in our lives, we receive power through the Atonement of Jesus Christ to overcome addiction and receive the full blessings of the gospel. Family and friends who practice these same 12 steps will also find hope and healing for themselves. We will now go around the room and read each of the 12 steps found on page Roman numeral number 4. We invite each person who is willing to read one step. It is perfectly acceptable to pass if you prefer to listen only. We will begin, here. We will begin to my left here with Robert. Step one, admit that you of yourself are powerless to overcome your addictions and that your life has become unmanageable. Step two, come to believe that the power of God can restore you to complete spiritual health. Step three, decide to turn your will and your life over to the care of God, the Eternal Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. Step four, make a searching and fearless written moral inventory of yourself. Step five, admit to yourself, to your Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, to proper priesthood authority, and to another person, the exact nature of your wrongs. Step six, become entirely ready to have God remove all your character weaknesses. Step seven, humbly ask Heavenly Father to remove your shortcomings. Tonight's step eight, seeking forgiveness. We make a written list of all persons we have harmed and become willing to make restitution to all of them. Step nine, uh, restitution and reconciliation. Uh, Wherever possible, make direct restitution to all persons you have harmed. Step 10, continue to take personal inventory, and when you are wrong, promptly admit it. Step 11, seek through prayer and meditation to know the Lord's will and to have the power to carry it out. Step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of the atonement of Jesus Christ, share this message with others and practice these principles in all you do. Thank you. Each week we focus on a different step. This week we will read step 8, starting on page 47, from a guide to addiction recovery and healing. We will go around the room, and each person who is willing may read one or two paragraphs. You may pass if you prefer to listen. We have an extra copy of the guide for you to use in this meeting in case you do not have one. During the reading, listen for thoughts and feelings and experiences you have in common with those who have taken these steps. We will continue with the reading of Step 8. Step 8, Seeking Forgiveness. Key Principle, make a written list of all persons you have harmed and become willing to make restitution to them. Before our recovery... Our addictive lifestyles were like a tornado full of destructive energy that cut through our relationships, leaving much wreckage behind. Step 8 was an opportunity to make a plan to clean up the wreckage and rebuild all that could be saved. When we felt the healing power of the Savior's mercy as we worked on Step 7, we felt eager to reach out to others and to mend broken relationships. We learned, however, that impulsively rushing to make amends without taking time for prayer and perhaps counsel from a trusted advisor, such as a bishop or other priesthood leader, could be as detrimental as not making amends. Step 8 was an assurance against harming others when we began contacting them in Step 9. Before we could rebuild relationships, we needed to identify the relationships that were damaged. We began to list people we had harmed, but many of us found we could not list these people without being distracted by feelings of resentment towards those who had harmed us. We honestly confessed our negative feelings to the Lord. In response, He showed us that we faced the same decision as the man in the parable, who, having been forgiven of all his debts, needed to forgive others. We could almost hear the Lord say to us, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me to. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? If you find yourself facing this problem, you may need to do as many of us have done. Before you make a list of people from whom you need to seek forgiveness, first list those people you need to forgive. Don't be surprised if some names appear on both lists. 
People often get caught in terrible cycles of exchanging hurts with others. To break these cycles of mutual resentment, someone has to be willing to forgive. To begin this process of forgiveness, we once more found the tool of writing to be invaluable. Next to the names of the people we needed to forgive, we recorded the way we originally felt when the, harm, when the hurtful incidents happened and what we were still tempted to feel. The list helped us be specific in our prayers as we shared with the Father all our unresolved feelings. We pled for the grace of Christ to help us extend to others the same mercy He gives us. If we found people on our lists that we had an especially difficult time forgiving, we took the Savior's counsel to pray for their welfare, asking all the blessings for them that we would want for ourselves. As we prayed for help to forgive others, even if it felt insincere at first, we were eventually blessed with a miraculous sense of compassion. Even in extreme situations, people who have taken this approach have received the ability to forgive far beyond themselves. One sister spent several weeks writing about her childhood and praying for her abusive father. She testifies with joy that the Savior has relieved her of her negative, painful feelings towards her father. In making a similar effort, we have learned that by making a thorough inventory of our resentments and acknowledging them to the Savior— we finally cease to be victims of those who hurt us. Once we honestly attempted to let go of offenses towards us, we found we were able to finish our list of those we hoped would forgive us. As you reach this point and begin your list, you should pray for guidance from the Lord. These guidelines may help. Ask yourself, is there anyone in my life, past or present, who I feel embarrassed, uncomfortable, or ashamed around? Write down their names and resist the temptation to justify your feelings or excuse your negative actions toward them. Include those you meant to hurt, of course, and those you did not mean intend to hurt. Include those who have passed away and those you have no idea how to contact. You will deal with these special cases when you take Step 9. For now, as you work through Step 8, focus on your willingness to be rigorous and un- unrelenting in your honesty. To be thorough, look for things we needed to do or things we left undone that hurt others. Don't leave out little things. Think honestly about the harm we caused others as we indulged in our addiction, even if we were not aggressive toward them. Admit the harm that we did to loved ones and friends by being irresponsible, irritable, critical, impatient, and dishonorable. Look for anything, large or small, that added to another person's burdens or that saddened or challenged someone. Look for lies you told or promises you broke and ways you manipulated or used others. List everyone who was affected. We may find our step four inventory as useful as a guide in this process. Finally, after we have listed everyone we have harmed, add one more name to the list, our own. When we indulged in our research and addictions, We harmed ourselves as well as others. As you work, remember that step eight is not an exercise in casting guilt or shame on anyone, either yourself or or those on your list. The Savior will lift the burdens of guilt and shame as you take one more honest look, look at troubles in your relationships and your part in them. By becoming willing, by becoming willing to make amends, you benefit from the peace of the peace of knowing that Heavenly Father is pleased with your efforts. This step helps you take the actions that enable the Savior to set you free from your past. Being willing, you will become ready to take step nine. Thank you. These 12 steps are a program of action. As we read the section called Action Steps, we learn about recovery and gospel actions we can take to come unto Christ and receive power to live in recovery from addiction. Let's continue reading uh, with the action steps. Robert. Forgive yourself and others. Make a list of people you might have offended or harmed. 
In step eight, you begin an amazing adventure in relating with a new heart to yourself, to others, and to life. You are ready to contribute peace to the world rather than add contention and negative feelings. You are willing to give up judging anyone unrighteously and to stop taking inventory of others' lives and faults. You are ready to stop minimizing your own behavior or making excuses for it. You are willing to take another thorough inventory, this time of those you have harmed. Although you may be terrified to consider it, you can become willing to meet the people on your list when the opportunity arises. You can prepare to do all you can to make amends to them. You can live by faith in the Lord, not in fear of what others might do. You can become willing in step eight to live a life guided by principles rather than by shame or fear. Seek the gift of charity. Pray for others. For thousands of years, people have read Paul's great discourse on charity and tried to model their lives after it. Many have struggled to have charity and have often fallen woefully short of doing so. The writings of the Prophet Mormon clarify what charity is and how to obtain it. He defined charity as the pure love of Christ and taught that the Father gives it to those who pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart and to all those who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ. Charity is a gift we receive as we learn to follow Jesus Christ and as we love him with all our hearts, minds, and souls. Filled with this pure love from him and for him, we find ourselves able to love others as he has loved us. We become able to forgive the faults of others and to make amends for our mistakes. In preparation for making amends, many of us have found the following exercise helpful. Think of someone for whom you have had hard feelings. For two weeks, deliberately kneel and pray for him or her each day. Keep a record of changes in your thoughts and feelings about that person. Thank you. We will now turn the time over to our facilitator, Robert, to conduct the sharing portion of this meeting. Robert? Hi, I'm Robert. I'm hey, Robert. I'm an addict and alcoholic. Hey, Robert. Good to see everybody. Happy birthday, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it occurred to me that uh, step eight uh, says become willing. There's another place the word willing is used in our sacrament prayers. It must be a reasonably powerful concept that we're willing to do something. Um. You know, the concept of forgiveness uh, reminds me uh, when I think about my recovery of awful years. I don't think about them that much anymore. Thank heavens. Uh, For at least five years, I struggled with really trying to recover, trying to stop, and I had no success at all, no luck. That's because, as I've mentioned before in this meeting, I was trying to do everything by myself. I thought I was smart enough to do it. Not a chance. But uh, I, in those days, I had a lot of resentments. If I got offended, it may have started out as something small, but if you, if you thought about it, think about resentments. The more you think about it, the bigger they get. You know, I'm really offended. Now that I think about it, I'm really mad. It just gets bigger and bigger. And it's so nice not to do that anymore. Not that I can't get offended, not that I don't get a resentment once in a while. I'm not, I'm not even close to being perfect, but nothing like those days where, you know, it's full out on resentments. I wanted vengeance, I have all kinds of negative, awful feelings that I just don't find the need to feel anymore. You just don't have to do that. And I will never forget um, the feeling I had as I completed this miraculous recovery in jail, uh, what it felt like to know that I had been forgiven of my sins. Now, you know, it took a while to process that because uh, and I think I, I, I think we notice that from time to time in our meetings that somebody will have done everything they possibly can. They'll have repented to the best of their ability, which I think is all that the Lord expects of us, and I think they may have already received forgiveness, but our faith is so weak sometimes that we were unwilling to acknowledge that it's done, it's over with. I was a bit like that. I, I had to process it for some period of time. I knew I felt different. 
And uh, I knew my heart had changed. I knew I had peace in my life, but it still took a while to say, what, you know, what happened to me? What's going on here? And uh, once I figured it out, my life, <laughs> my life even got a lot better. But um, I had an interesting experience. Uh, I'd have my temple blessings restored at one point in time and after all this. And uh, I go into the office of uh, the 70 at that time. I'm not sure they still do it with the general authority, but I go in and uh, he's got my, he had my, my church rap sheet. What looked like it to me, well, that's how I felt it. And he's looking at it and he says, um, I just don't think, I don't, I don't think you're ready to have your blessings restored. And I said, well, Okay, that's fine. Whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do. If it's five years, if it's another year, if it's six months, you just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. So we talked some more and he brought my wife, told me to go out and brought my wife back in and talked to her and wanted to know if I'd abused her in any way. <laughs> and then uh, he said, well, all right, give me a few minutes. And uh, he called us back in. And he said, okay, Robert, I've decided to restore your blessings and he said, just sit there. And he came around and put his hands on my head. And he told me, he told me that my sins had been forgiven. I'll just, it was just a final confirmation, if you will, that something I should have already recognized and known that this, is, this had happened. But considering my past and what I'd done and the sins that I had committed, uh, I just didn't think it was ever possible that that could possibly happen. And I am, I will never forget that. It's a blessing that all of us, I think, in this room have experienced of having that, had that happen. I testify of the goodness of the Savior, of his atonement, strengthening power that allows us to do things that we can't do for ourselves. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thanks, Thanks, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. I don't think we uh, anybody show up late, so uh, we'll now begin the sharing portion of the meeting. Share about your personal recovery experience as it relates to the tools of recovery. This week's step or the step you're currently working on. Please focus your sharing on the solution rather than the problem. Refrain from mentioning graphic details about the practice of your addiction. Remember, crosstalk, which is interrupting or commenting directly about another participant's remarks, is not appropriate. Also, it is perfectly acceptable to pass if you prefer to listen only. Confidentiality and anonymity foster honesty and make this a safe place to share. Therefore, whom you see here and what you hear here, when you leave here, let it stay here. Yeah. You're here. In keeping with the principle of anonymity, we invite you to introduce yourself by your first name only. We'll conclude the sharing portion five minutes before the Elder Ennis usually needs at least 10 minutes before the end of the meeting and for final thoughts from Elder Ennis. Time is now yours to share your experience, faith, and hope. We invite you to share from three to five minutes. So we'll give you a signal if you have used your allowable time. In this meeting will proceed counterclockwise from the first person who shares. Who would like to begin? Hi, I'm Steve. Hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. Um, I'm grateful to be here. I'm, I'm grateful for uh, what Robert has shared. It's uh, it's humbling to to think back uh, uh, on the on the time when when uh, the church said that the Lord has forgiven us, and it's 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 nice to be brought back to that. Um, Seeking forgiveness, key principle, uh, make a, wrist, a written list of all persons we have harmed and become willing to make restitution to them. Um, this step is to, to become willing, just like Robert said. And, uh, you know, after I was forgiven, I remember how good I felt and anything that was required of me, I was willing to do. Um, so, so I was willing. Um, there's a, a few things that it says in here. It says, uh, let's see, where'd it go? Um, is, um, as you begin this point, point, or 
As you reach this point and begin your list, you should pray for guidance from the Lord. I think that's key. These guidelines may help. Ask yourself, is there anyone in my life, past or present, who, who, who I feel embarrassed, uncomfortable, or ashamed around? Um, I think that uh, helps us uh, minimize it pretty pretty accurately. I mean, um, there, there was a lot of people I was embarrassed or uncomfortable or ashamed around. It. You know, I was, I was in my addiction for so long. And when when I was there, you know, the world revolved around me. If it, if everybody could help me out, then I was I was nice and pleasant. But but if 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 people couldn't you know help me out, then I really didn't even call them. Had nothing to do with them. So I guess you could say I uh, burnt a lot of bridges. Um, I want to share a quick story of uh, one of those people that I didn't even. I didn't even know that I had hurt this particular person. I had no idea. But it, uh, the person being uh, my brother's wife, um, about, I'd say, six months after I got out of jail, um, I, I just really wanted to, ha- to hang out with my brother because I hadn't seen him for for quite some time. And, and so I call him up and ask him if I could take him and his family to a movie and and he says, yeah, I would love to do that. He was really excited and enthusiastic to to hear from me and, and to, to go do this with me. So so I go and pick him up, and we we head off to the movies. And uh, once there, we had a, a really good time. And the kids was laughing. My brother was laughing. But I noticed his, his wife was really standoffish, and it was a, a feeling of uneasiness. It was... Uh, I didn't really understand it, but it, it, it continued to, to, to go on through, through the night. Um, but, but we got, we got done watching the movie. The kids had a great time. And, and so I, I really didn't want the night to end. So I, I took them all out for, for ice cream and, and we just had a, a, a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, she was, she was still, uh, very standoffish, and uh, and it was. I was like, "What did did I do something to her?" I couldn't really figure it out. But when I was dropping dropping them off at home, uh, I received an impression, and it said, "Ask her to forgive you." And I I didn't understand it, but but I, I followed that prompting, and I says, uh, I says. Uh, I'm so sorry for for everything I have ever done to you and your family. I said, will you please forgive me? And right then, I, there was this huge, huge, like, power that I felt. And, and she just started to cry. And she says, Stephen, she says, I was so scared of you. I didn't want my kids to be around you. She says, you have no idea how scared of you I was. And I, I never did anything that I thought to harm her. But that just goes to show, you know, um, we're, we're hurting people constantly without realizing it. So, so I just bear witness. If, uh, but, but she says, of course I forgive you. She says, I love you. And uh, ever since then, you know, I... I go around her. I don't have to feel embarrassed or ashamed or there's not that uneasiness. It's a, she's actually happy to see me and, and, you know, she trusts me around the kids. I mean, life, life is so much better when, when we decide to turn our wills over to Heavenly Father and, and, and listen to his counsel. I mean, these steps are inspired, and I just I bear witness that if we work these steps with the desperation of a drowning man— that we will find ha- happiness and peace and forgiveness, which thank goodness for that, because if I had to pay for my own sin, sins, um, it would be an awful, awful big debt to pay. And uh, I'm grateful for my Redeemer. I, I'm grateful that, that I have the opportunities that I have to serve him. And um, I love you all. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks, Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. My name is Dub. 
Hey, Doug. I'm a grateful son of God who has multiple allergies. I'm allergic to alcohol, tobacco, drugs, pornography, lusts, lying, cheating, stealing, conning, manipulating. Uh, by the time I got to the eighth step, I realized that that's who I was, and I needed to pretty much make amends to every person I had known to that point in my life because uh, I was never very smart, but somehow I figured if I could uh, be mean, it would make up for it. So I know that doesn't make any sense. That's why we call ourselves addicts. When I started my list, back in step four, my uh, AA sponsor uh, uh, made me burn it when we were done with it because it said it could be very harmful. So when I got to eight, I thought, wow, this would be nice if I had some of those things as kind of a starting point, but I didn't, which allowed me to discover the same magic I found that this writing magic that takes place, anything that you can move from, from here to here to here and then see it and feel it on paper is, is really healing. And it made the process so soft and gentle instead of hard and scratchy. And so uh, I, I got through that list pretty pretty soon. And then the first big lesson I learned on step eight was that you need to make sure that uh, your eldest brother is part of not only arranging the order of the list, but it, in what order you should visit them. Because I wanted to pick out the soft one, you know. My grandma had stole three lemons or something from her, so I, I wanted to hit that one and get, get a good run start. And of course, we know that doesn't work. Uh, the Savior wanted me to go for the big one that I had burned my neighbor's barn down on purpose. And uh, that was a little tougher. Uh, he was my bishop. He knew I did it at the time, and he knew I did it on purpose at the time. But you still had to verbalize it. I tell my sponsor, I said, he knows all this. This is ridiculous. And he goes, no, Dub, you're not getting it. You have to verbalize it to him you know, so write it like you mean it because you're going to have to go face to face and, and reenact this from 17 years ago. So that was my experience, and uh, it was very, very difficult. And we have, we have such a nice big group that everybody needs to have time to share today. I'm going to have to cut that story short just by saying that when it was all said and done at the end of step eight, I had learned more about Dub than the other seven combined. And that's what happens when you're willing to put everything in that you have to. Just high risk, high reward. I know that God lives and that Jesus is the Christ. I still battle these uh, these steps on a daily basis, and that's what keeps me clean and sober. I say that in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, Thanks, Doug. Doug. Thanks, Doug. Love you, Doug. Thank you. I am Scott. Hi, Scott. 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 I am so grateful for this step in so many ways. As I've mentioned before, I one of my biggest things that kept me locked <clears throat> locked in my addiction was a lot of resentment and blame over the years. And at some point in time, a combination of people and things I was reading led me to start looking back a little bit. I've ran across some write an article recently that basically makes it sound as if we don't need to look back but we need to just look to the Savior and look forward, and looking back doesn't do any good. Um, for me, my experience was different. It, it did me a whole lot of good to look back at both what I had done and who I had done it to, but as I looked at 
the why I had done what I had done and how I had become the person I was, it made me realize I was just doing the best I knew how. I was just trying to cope with all the things that had happened to me in the best way a child knows how. Um, of course, those childish coping mechanisms don't work very well as, as an adult, and they continue to feed my addiction over time, but that process of looking back at why I had done all those things I needed to seek forgiveness for helped me realize I, I was doing the best I could, and thus others probably were doing the best they knew how to. My parents, inadequate as they were at nurturing me and giving me what I needed, they were doing the best they knew how. The kids that were teasing me for years in school, they were somehow trying to get by the best they knew how to. And somehow my need to forgive others just kind of came as a gift that way. I didn't have to struggle with trying to work on it because as I came to see how God viewed me and my trials and how he viewed my process of growing up with all my weaknesses, I came to see others that same way and realized I needed to give them the same benefit of the doubt. I realized God had been given me all along, and it was just so powerful. Just uh, all that resentment and angst against all these people just melted away, and it's not something I could have done on my own. I absolutely bear witness. It was the Savior that took that, Sometimes I've heard people say, oh, you just need to give it to the Savior. But what does that mean, and how do you go about that? I've struggled various times as I've heard that. And for me, that was the how. Come to see how God feels about me. Come to learn of his love for me. I can begin to love myself and forgive myself, and it naturally takes care of others. Um. I don't know that I have a whole lot else to share other than just bear my witness that forgiveness it really is possible, and it does come. It comes as we come to understand our Heavenly Father. I often viewed Christ as the merciful one and God as the just one, but I viewed God wrong because they're the same, and their love for me and each and every one of us is is just so powerful, and it's, it's great to realize and to feel that. Whenever I'm feeling alone, I can feel that love constantly, and I bear witness of that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Hello. My name is Rich. Hey, Rich. Hi, Rich. I am a child of God, and I'm grateful to be with you guys tonight. Um, step eight, seeking forgiveness. Uh, I'm just going to share some of my experience real quickly, and then I I felt prompted to share another story, so I'm going to do that. But um, for me, forgiving myself was the harder of the tasks. Um, I didn't become willing to approach anyone until I was able to forgive myself, Um, and that made it much easier in the uh, possibility of if that person did not forgive me and I had not forgiven myself, it would have just proven to me that I was unforgivable. And so it was it was required for me to forgive myself, um, regardless of what another person's forgiveness of me would be. So a story that, for whatever reason I feel prompted to share, is about an experience in a meeting that I had. Um, I was fairly um, early into recovery, probably in the first year or so, and I was in a meeting, and one of the missionaries shared this story about this struggling man's life. And um, he went and met with a priesthood leader. And the advice that he was given was that he was to change his music that he listened to. Uh, He challenged him, I believe, to listen to the Mormon tabernacle on his way to and from work. Gave him no other advice. Just said, I want you to do that, that simple thing in changing your music. And when I heard this missionary share this story, I felt the Spirit just confirm this truth to me that there was something to this message. And so I changed my music um, all of the time, except when I would go to the gym or when I would go running. Uh, and at those times, I would prefer to listen to this fast-paced, catchy music um, 
that I was used to. And I had this day where I was listening to my Christian music on my way home from work, and I stopped at the gym, and I switched my playlist, and I pressed play on this music. And the moment that this note rang out from this worldly uh, music that I listened to when I was at the gym, I felt the spirit depart from me. And it was it was really terrifying, honestly. It scared me because I had moments earlier felt the comfort of the Spirit, whether or not I even knew it. And I had in this moment uh, had the switch of feeling the Spirit leave me. Um, and it, it frightened me. I went home that day and I actually deleted all of that music from my music library. All of these unrighteous songs that, that contain lyrics that were not in line with the teachings of Jesus Christ. And I listen to that same music on um, a Sunday or any day of the week now, whether or not I'm going to the gym or running or whatever it is. Um, that simple suggestion, for whatever reason, has made one of the biggest impacts in my life. That happened right around the time in which I was getting ready um, to even consider seeking forgiveness for myself. Um, I've used that changing my music as a tool um, to help me in those moments in when I, which I felt weakened or that I felt the, the presence of the adversary in my life. And uh, it's been a big blessing to me. I just felt prompted to share that. And I want to testify that there is power uh, in worthy and righteous music, that the hymns of the church are a prayer. Um, and to pray continuously to listen to that music is very, very powerful. I want to bear my testimony of, of the power of that as well as seeking forgiveness and this part of step eight being forgiving yourself. For me, that was paramount. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Hi, my name's Karen. I'm an addict. Hey, Karen. Hi, Karen. And the first time I went through step eight, I kind of like all the other steps we've talked about. The first time I went through it, I probably didn't get it quite completely right but you know we kind of learn and grow in steps but I was still pretty much just cruising along thinking I'm doing great to be in recovery and just storming through the steps and my situation was a little different where when I quit using drugs I was a charge nurse on a in a hospital unit and basically in charge of everybody else on the unit and the doctors even had to come to me to schedule surgeries and stuff like that and to clear the operating room with me and I basically uh, administered on the whole unit and so when I was caught and fired I impacted a lot of people and all of them except for one told me afterwards that they had no idea that this was going on and the one that did know is the one who turned me in and thank goodness she did but um so when I got to step eight the first time, um, my family, I should say, also had no idea that I was using or anything like that. My husband didn't know. Nobody knew. And they, at least they say they didn't know. And so I didn't feel like I had really done anything wrong to them because they didn't have any clue that, that anything was going on. Yeah, I was cr grumpy and and ignored everyone all the time, but... Um, I didn't feel like I had hurt them, so I just, when I got to step eight, and I'm still kind of in denial anyway because, you know, I would have quit on my own if I hadn't been fired and all those excuses that we give. But so I basically, my list the first time just went down and listed all the doctors and the nurses I worked with and the nurses' aides and the housekeepers and everybody else that worked under my leadership, and that's pretty much what my list was. And when I got to step nine, I made sure that I apologized to all them and got it out of the way. Well, it wasn't until a couple of years later, still in recovery, that I realized that I really did hurt my family and I really had hurt, whether they knew it or at the time that I was using or not. They were impacted by the things that I was doing while I was using. And it's uh, sometimes I just think I'm a slow learner. I don't know why it took me two years to figure this out, but I really did hurt a lot of other people around me, and so I kind of had to go through and do this step over again. And it's an ongoing process for sure. Um, 
I just, as I was sitting here, I remembered a story, too, that I felt like I wanted to share when I was on my mission. I went on a mission, and my companion and I lived in an apartment. Well, it was a house. We rented a room from an elderly lady, widow, who lived by herself, and we just rented a room from her. And she scared me to death. She was like one of those ladies that was really, really into her routines and really set in her ways. And she used to scrub the copper on the bottom of her pans and stuff like that. And I was just like, ah, I mean, everything had its place. And she would know if we touched anything. And she was very, very strict. Well, one night, my companion and I made spaghetti. And I was twirling around being silly or something. And I dropped this plate of spaghetti and the plate broke all over the place. And I was just like mortified because I was like, what am I going to do if I have to tell this lady? She's going to notice that she only has seven in her set now instead of eight. And and I was so scared that I actually stood over it for several days. And I thought, well, maybe she just won't notice. I just won't say anything. And she never did notice or say anything, but it just kept eating at me and eating at me and eating at me. So finally after... A few days, I went up to her and I said, uh, I am so sorry. I will paint your house. I will do whatever you need me to do, but I am so sorry I broke one of your plates. And she just looked at me and said, um, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, it'll be fine. And she went on along her way like it was no big deal, but it was such a thing, a uh, weight lifted off of me that it was like, phew, finally I can go on with my work. Well, that wasn't the end of the story. A couple days later in the morning, her phone was ringing, and we noticed she wasn't answering her phone, and she always answered her phone in the morning. So I walked in there to see, you know, if she was sleeping or what, and she had passed away during the night. And what was the very first thing that came to my mind? <laughs> Not, ah, there's a dead lady laying here. That wasn't the first thing. It was... I am so glad I told her about that plate. And it is just kind of the same thing with forgiveness and the way it frees us. And I feel like I definitely agree forgiving myself has been the hardest part of the whole process. But I do feel such a freedom and, and I don't know, just a power, empowering feeling to know that I have been forgiven by my Heavenly Father, and I know that I have been forgiven. And as a result of that, I don't have to fear um, what people think or or whatever. I can go on and I can still make good choices and I don't have to define myself by who I used to be because I'm not that person anymore. And I, I, I remember feeling on one instance that even though we identify ourselves as being addicts or alcoholics that I was praying one night and just feeling bad and feeling the Lord saying, I don't see you as an addict. I'm not identifying you as an addict. You're not an addict to me, basically, is what the message I was getting was. You're a child of God. I love you. I know you. I know the big picture is what he's saying. I know who you really are. And to me, you're not an addict is what I felt that night. And I just thought how amazing that is that we can be forgiven and we don't have to define ourselves by these things that we've done in the past. But it is important that we get these things settled and taken care of before it's too late in order to find that freedom and the ability to move on and progress in our lives. And I really know that that's true, and I'm grateful for the opportunity we have to forgive others I think it's interesting that this, the whole almost first page of this chapter, which is called Seeking Forgiveness, the whole first page is talking about us forgiving others. Is I, I think that's not by accident that in order for us to seek forgiveness, we have to forgive others. And that's a hard thing for us to do with all of our resentments that we have. <laughs> so anyway, I'm grateful that the Lord didn't judge me and didn't say, no, I've already forgiven you a thousand times for that, so I'm not going to do it again like I would like to do with those who I feel like continue to harm me. Um, the Lord's never said that to me. You've done it one too many times, so no, I'm not going to forgive you. So I have to forgive those who harm me over and over again, too. So anyway, that's all I have. Thanks. I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Good. 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 Good.
I'm Lindsay. I'm an addict. Hi. More importantly, I am a daughter of God today. Um, you know, and I walk tall and I can look people in the eyes today. Um, and it's because of these steps that I have worked. Um, step eight for me, I had a really cool experience with step eight, um, seeking forg- forgiveness. I was um, making my list and going in prayer about this and praying about it. And um, and I was kind of struggling a little bit. I mean, I had listed pretty much everyone that I knew because um, I definitely had hurt pretty much everyone I had kind of come in contact with in my life. Um, but I knew I was still missing some people, you know, some important people. Um, so I continued to, to go to my meetings. I continued to pray. I continued to work on this list. And um, I had a person come to mind. Um, and it was my first son that I had that I placed for adoption at 19 years old. Um, and I just pictured him standing um, in this field, <laughs> waiting for me to come visit, and I was not there. Um, And it was a really hard few days for me, and I felt like I had put that behind me um, because the adoption actually was one of the most amazing experiences of my whole life, Um, the most spiritual experience, I would say, right up there with going to the temple. Um, And it was amazing, but I still had a lot of pain, and I I hadn't shown up for him because it was an open adoption. And there were times where I had the opportunity to visit with him and um, and his parents are photographers and take pictures and they're just awesome, these amazing people. So I had this, you know, this image come to mind and um, it was really hard for me. For about a week, I just was in tears about this and brought it up in a few meetings and I really struggled with this and I just, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get over that I could forget forget something like that, that I could forget how much I must have hurt him. You know, how could I have done that? Um, And I love that little boy so much. Um, He's such a gift. And the adoption was such a gift. And what was cool is as I was going through this process and as I was becoming, you know, willing to seek forgiveness from him and um, place him on my list, I was able to start to forgive myself um, because I had been beating myself up for so many years over this. And I had no idea I was even doing it. Um, I had so much shame and so much guilt and so much hatred um, that it it was a lot of weight, a lot of darkness around me for this one thing um, that I thought I was past. Um, so what was cool is I was able to to work through that pain and what I think was a spiritual, you know, spiritual gift. You know, Heavenly Father blessed me with that that opportunity to work through that and to um, work through that pain and to forgive myself and. Today, he's, he's still on my list. Um, I haven't decided how, you know, how or when I will be able to make that amends. But I know that in um, the right time and in the right way, I will be able to today. And I'm confident of that. And I just, I love, you know, I love all these steps. And today I was, I was struggling with coming to this meeting today. And I've just, I've had a kind of a rough week and I haven't felt as worthy for some reason. And I, you know, I know the adversary is real and he's right there. You know, um, when we're trying to make right decisions, he's going to be right there at our door, you know, knocking it down. But the thing that I do know too, is that we have so much more power than he does, you know, and coming to this meeting, that's all we have to do. We just have to be willing. We just have to show up in the right places at the right time and we get blessed. And that's what step eight is about for me. It's about showing up. It's about being willing and doing, you know, the right things at the right time. Um, And the Lord will bless us and let us know how to do those things. Um, For this step, I really think a lot of it is just it's stepping out of that fear and stepping into faith. You know, it says um, you can live by faith in the Lord, not in fear of what others might do. And today, you know, I choose to um, to try to seek the acceptance of the Lord and not of people. And that was really hard for me to do because for a lot of years I was so consumed about what other people thought about me. And if they thought, you know, I was good enough or smart enough or pretty enough, you know, and that's not what it's about today. I don't have to, I don't have to live like that anymore. I don't have to obsess about things like that anymore. You know, I know that the Lord loves me today. I know, um, you know, I know I'm, I'm his daughter And I had different experiences about feeling forgiven, um, but mine, like my ultimate (laughs) kind of experience, I guess, was um, during my my interview for my Temple Recommend. And and I just remember at the end of that interview, I just felt 
for the first time, I knew that I was, I was worthy. I was worthy to, to enter, you know, the Lord's house. And I knew that I had been forgiven for all of the wrongdoings that I had done. Um, and it was such an awesome experience, you know, and I just love, I love forgiveness. I love that the Lord's willing to forgive us and, um, and that we can forgive others today. And I, I choose to, I choose to forgive others today. And I, um, choose to seek their forgiveness. And I have a testimony that the Lord lives, that he loves us so, so very much, and that he is always there with us every step of the way. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks, Thanks, Lindsay. Oh, Lindsay. Thanks, Hi, Mabra. Hey, Mabra. Hey, Mabra. I'm a recovering addict. Um, my experience with step eight the first time, you know, I had plowed through step four and five, and it was rough. And so I got through step six and seven, and I thought, I'm just going to get in there and just do it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. And so I didn't, um, you know, I, it, I thought, I'm going to make my list. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to get it done. And um, I didn't really read the whole part about, you know, somebody's dead, what to do, that it tells you to do it in the next step because it's going to tell you how to take care of that. And um, <laughs> I, I think I just missed that part of the whole meeting um, because I have a sister who passed away, and I was very angry with her, and I had been very angry with her for a couple of years. And so I decided that I was going to go and I was going to take care of this. That She had to listen to me now because she was dead and she couldn't do anything about it. And so I went to the cemetery, and she had been, she'd been dead probably, uh, probably a year, I guess. So the grass had just started growing back over, right? And the, you could still see the mound. And so her her grave is probably about oh, 200 yards from the from the groundskeeper's shack, you know, where they where they sit for the day. It was in October, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just pounding my fists on her grave, and I'm just yelling and telling her everything that she had done wrong, and for like an hour and a half. And I could see this guy and he was pointing his head out the, out the door and he's looking at me and he must've thought that I was just insane. And I'm just telling her all these horrible things that she did to our family. I mean, she, she bankrupt my mom and dad's company. She stole a whole bunch of stuff and to get her drugs. And then she got, she got sick and and in this process of this hour and a half of me just wailing at her, just telling her what a horrible person she was, and I hoped that, you know, she had gone to the bad place in heaven and she was never going to get to go anywhere. And, you know, they were going to have to be missionaries teaching her 24 hours a day in heaven because she was just this bad person. And um, I had this really wonderful experience come to me, and I had this feeling like, now you need to listen to what I have to say. And I just started weeping. And for the next hour, I just knew that I had to ask her for her forgiveness. And because I was not a good sister to her the last year of her life, she had gone to jail and gotten clean. She had stayed sober. She had gone to meetings. She was doing everything she had to do. Um, but I couldn't forgive her and she died alone and without her son. And I told my parents that I didn't want her in our home because I didn't believe her. I didn't think that she had changed and I was laying on her grave, just begging her to forgive me. And the Lord did something that I have never felt in my life. Uh, through my MS illness and through, through my own recovery, I felt the Lord put his arms around me and tell me that I was forgiven. And I knew that she was there with me. And I, I can still hear her in my mind when she says, I love you. And I know that 
forgiveness comes to everyone. And we're all worth forgiveness. We don't have to, which, by the way, I do not, I, I do not want anybody to go and do that because that is the most horrible experience because that groundskeeper, I swear, was going to call the police on me. Um, he, he thought I was insane. Um, but I know that the Lord wants us to ask for forgiveness. He wants us to go and be the best people that we can be. He wants us to, whether it hurts us or not, he wants us to understand that we're all children of God. Everybody, whether it's the the beggar on the street or the richest man in the best house, and we all deserve to forgive one another. And the thing I learned that day was that as mad as I was at my sister, she didn't deserve to be alone. And I still... She's been gone for four and a half years. And I still, every time I go to the cemetery, ask her to forgive me for that. And I know my Heavenly Father's forgiven me, but I still feel like I have some kind of guilt over that because she died a a very horrible death. And sometimes it's those kind of forgivenesses that remind us that our Heavenly Father loves us and that he does forgive everyone because I know he forgave her and he'll forgive me. Step eight has taught me that, one, you need to slow down and do it in the right frame of mind and do it with prayer. But it also taught me that my Heavenly Father loves everybody. And there's not one person exempt from that love. And I am so grateful to this program. I love all of you. I am so grateful to be here with you tonight. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank Thank you. you. My name's Scott, and I'm a recovering addict. Hey, Scott. 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 Um, When I was in my active in my addiction, I I used to just want people to get off my back. You know, I just wanted, um, I thought I was only hurting myself, and I didn't think, you know, why won't my family just leave me alone and let me, you know? And it wasn't until, like, until I was actually, I remember when I was in my, the courtroom for sentencing and sitting in there with all these other inmates that were being transported, and I looked out at the audience, and and all these people were there, you know? And it was like, I'm like, why is my ex-girlfriend's dad there you know why is my my brother's wife's sister there you know why are all these people in the audience that as far as I concerned was concerned I didn't even know I'd heard them or anything and and my attorney brings me all these letters that they had written and and you know told me he had he had told me you know like well here's a bunch of letters to the judge that you know these people that are mad at you and I was reading them, and I'm like, "Holy cow!" You know, it was it was really opened my eyes, and and you know, of course, I was right then. I was sentenced to the Utah State Prison, and I just walked out of there, and it was the beginning of 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 re- realization, you know, of of what I had done, and um, it took me several years, you know, to actually start making a list of people I had harmed. And because it was something I didn't want to face. And once I was clear-headed, you know, there was a a certain incident that just was always at the top of the list. And um, it was an incident when I was, I had uh, 
taken off and went to Southern California and got involved in uh, um, this uh, drug culture of, of selling methamphetamine and, and um, with these, uh, I guess, you know, you'd call them gangs, gangsters, gangbanger type people. And I was living in the house with them and um, at one point, I, we everybody was using and everybody was you know we were we were selling and stuff. It was in Emmett, California, and um, this one night I remember uh, the doorbell rang and all these guys, all these you know these Mexican gangsters are like, oh, well, the cops are here and everybody hide, everybody get down and. And so I got down and, and um, I heard the doorbell ring again and and everybody's like, just be quiet until they leave. And for some reason I was like, you know, go check who it, you know, if it's the cops or whatever. And, and I went over and I just peeked through the peephole. My dad was standing there on the porch. And I'm like, I was like, it's my dad. And they're like, what? What's your dad doing here? I was like, I don't know. And I was so like messed up on on methamphetamines that I was starting to question whether I was really seeing what I was seeing, you know. I was like, well maybe it's not really my dad, maybe I just am thinking it is and so I opened the door and my dad's standing there, he goes he goes, Grab your stuff, we're going home. And I was like, How did you find this? And and he's just like, Grab your stuff, we're going home. And I went to start gathering up my stuff, and I'm thinking, you know, I don't really want to go home. You know, we had this shipment coming in, you know, and it was like I went out to the car and I put put it in the trunk, and I was like, well, let's just go home tomorrow. I want to go home tomorrow. And my brother-in-law was in the car, and and they both got out, and they're like, you're coming home now. And... I was like, just spend the night, you know, in a hotel, and I promise I'll go home tomorrow. Because in my mind, I was thinking, you know, once if I if I can just get all this drugs, then I can hide it, and I can come home, and and I'll be okay for a while, and you know that way I'm. And they're like, it's either now or never. Get in the car, and I was like, I'm not going. And then my dad, with tears in his eyes, grabbed my bags out of the trunk set him down, and then he drove off. And I remember at the time I I was just blaming them. I'm like, well, why did you guys come down here, you know? You know, they drove nine hours from from Orem, Utah, down to Hammett, California, and I, I'm not even sure exactly how they found the place I was living, but um, that was something that when I went to make my list— Every time I just, it was painful to think about that because I was like, you know, how could I? And I just procrastinated, I put it off. And it was like about the fifth year of, fifth, five, about, yeah, about five, or five years into my sentence, I decided, you know, it's time. It's time to approach this. And I made a list of all sorts of things, but that one was at the top of my list and my parents were coming to visit and they came in and i just i just said i've got to get a couple things off my chest and started telling them you know like everything i've done you know like when i snuck out when i was a teenager and just everything just started telling them reading them this list and and then i just looked at my dad and i just told him you know and uh i want to say that i'm sorry for when you came all the way down to get me and i didn't go and he said you know when we left I thought that was going to be the last time I ever saw you alive he said but as as he said as far as I'm concerned you are forgiven and I just felt overwhelmed when I left that visit I felt like all this burden had been lifted off of me you know because all these years I carried that and I'm sure, of course, my dad did too because he's the one who went through it. But I just couldn't believe, you know, 
what that I had done that. And I'm so thankful, you know, for this this program. And because if it wasn't for this program and working that step, I would have never had the opportunity. And, you know, after what Karen said, I, I just was thinking, you know, what what if and what if I was never given that opportunity? And and I'm grateful that I was and that, you know, my Heavenly Father has, has rescued me, you know, from from that past. And Jesus Christ has given me another opportunity for a new life, you know, because I, that life before I lost from, from uh, the life before whatever, you know, I had gained in life or whatever was, was lost because of addiction. And, and now it's been restored to me because that's what this program's about is restoration. You know, I got out of prison two years ago and I would have never in my wildest dreams thought that I would meet a girl, you know, 13 years younger than me. I'd have another opportunity, you know, to have a family because I, I, I didn't get to raise my kids because I was gone. And, and now they're, you know, 18, 16. And, and, uh, I'm just grateful. I love, I love this program and I love my heavenly father and I love all you guys here because I feel like we can all relate to one another no matter what our addictions are, you know? And so these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Thanks, Thanks God. God. Boy, Scott. Good stuff. Thank you so much. Um, you know, one of the best parts of recovery is being able to meet with folks like you. Think what we were like before and what we're like now. Good grief, you know. It's a pretty big change, isn't it? We're better people. We're stronger people. And that's the fun of going to meetings and seeing these people that come in and follow them through almost. It's just so extraordinary. Thank you so much. Elder Ennis, it's up to you now. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Thanks, Robert. Robert. Uh, I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> Not you. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Elder Ennis. Hi, Elder Ennis. <laughs> and once again, um, as always, it's uh, it's a humbling, it's an honor, and it's humbling to be here with you. Um, as we've gone through and as... Uh, I've listened to your stories, and there's just a flood of experiences, uh, a flood of uh, emotions um, that I've experienced in my life uh, within my recovery. Um, You know, I think uh, one of the main things is... uh, an, over, an overwhelming sense of gratitude uh, towards those individuals in my life that I hurt so deeply uh, and the willingness, the kindness, and the love and ultimately the forgiveness that they have extended to me. Uh, I once again need to extend my thankfulness to them, to my Savior, uh, for the forgiveness that they've extended to me. Um, there are angels in my life and they have helped me through, uh, some pretty tough areas of my life and they have been key in not only forgiving me, but, uh, helping me obtain forgiveness and even more importantly, uh, me forgiving, uh, which is the part of forgiveness, which is the part of uh, step eight that I want to focus on. Um, Not taking anything away from being forgiven. forgiven. Uh, It's been my experience and my belief that being forgiven is one thing, uh, but the more important thing uh, is what forgiveness does for the individual who needs to forgive. Uh, Yes, it's very liberating and very soothing and very healing to know that we've been forgiven, to know that I've been forgiven. But on the flip side of that, more importantly, 
uh, forgiving others who have wronged me. Uh, that's actually prerequisite to receiving forgiveness. Um, there's a scripture in Luke chapter 6, uh, <clears throat> verses 36 and 37. It says, be, be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Uh, ultimately, that's the order that it goes in before we can receive forgiveness. And even within the step, it specifically says, uh, page 47, uh, third paragraph, um, before you make a list of people from whom you need to seek forgiveness, first list those people who you need to forgive. Uh, before we can receive forgiveness, uh, before we can go to the Lord and, and receive that boon of forgiveness from Him every time that we go and we still have people that we haven't forgiven, if we hush ourselves and listen very intently, you'll hear His voice saying, there's a couple others you need to go and you need to get things taken care of. And it's really us Whenever we forgive, it's us releasing ourselves from poison. It's us releasing ourselves from our bitterness. We're taking the Savior in His atonement, and we're actually, through our willingness and exercising our agency in forgiving others, um, we're choosing to open the door that He's unlocked so we can walk out of a cell that we've placed ourselves in by holding on to grudges and not forgiving the ones that we have have viewed that have offended us or hurt, a, hurt, hurt us in our lives. Um, it's the Savior and His love. It's the Savior and His grace that we receive once we have willingly gone out on our limb and showed that we are willing to forgive uh, others the way he's forgiven us. Um, within the Bible dictionary, one of my most favorite uh, uh, definitions in there, uh, page 697, under grace, it says, the main idea of the word is divine means of help or strength given through the bounteous mercy and love of Jesus Christ. It go, continues on and it says, It is likewise through the grace of the Lord that individuals through faith in the atonement of Jesus Christ and repentance of their sins receive strength and assistance to do, uh, to do good works that they otherwise would not be able to uh, maintain if left to their own means. This grace is an, an, is an enabling power that allows men and women to lay hold on eternal life and exaltation after they have ex extended their own best efforts. You know, so it, this grace, this help from heaven, the help that only the Savior can give us, for us to, to be worthy of that help and for us to qualify ourselves and place ourselves in a position to receive that help from Him, we need to be willing, first and foremost, to take the step and stand at the threshold and do what we want others to do for us. We need to forgive first and be willing to do that. And then he can take his power and touch the lives of those individuals who we need to forgive. And in turn, uh, there's a softening that will take place that they in turn can forgive us, which is what we so desire. And in closing, I just want to uh, share another favorite scripture on forgiveness uh, found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. And a lot of it's counsel towards us, uh, but in the last verse that I'll read, uh, the ultimate reason why we need to forgive others is stated. 
Verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to one another. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Ultimately, our Heavenly Father, His love, His mercy, His grace, His forgiveness. Uh, it's all possible because of what our Savior Jesus Christ has done. Uh, the things that He endured, the things that He bore in our behalf and willingly suffered it, enables us to receive forgiveness from our Heavenly Father because our Savior willingly did it. And because of His willingness, uh, that gleans favor from our Father in Heaven, and He forgives us because of Christ's sake. So, in all of our step eights, and however many times we have to continue to exercise our step eight, uh, we need to always remember that first and foremost that we need to be forgiving so that we can receive that forgiving grace that our Heavenly Father so, willing want, so willingly wants to give us and that we can only receive after we have done our part. I want to testify of our Savior. I want to testify of His love. I want to testify of His redeeming power and His love for each and every one of God's children, the willingness that He bore the pains and the sickness and the grief and the sins of us all in any degree. He willingly did it because He loves us. And I testify of that redeeming love, and I testify of that power, the power that He has to liberate the captive souls, to break the chains of addiction, to obliterate habits, and to rescue uh, wounded and broken souls. Uh, we all want to turn others to our Savior and His love so He can redeem and exercise that power that he possesses. I testify of him and his love, and I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks, Thank Elder. you. Thanks, in closing, please remember that what has been shared here is confidential, and the, opinion, and the opinions expressed here are those of the individual who expressed them and do not necessarily represent LDS Family Services or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We encourage you to purchase a personal copy of the guide for note-taking during the meeting. We also recommend using the studying and understanding and action step sections between meetings to build upon, to build on what you have heard and experienced in this meeting. Finally, we thank each of you for your participation. Your presence here demonstrates your humility and faith and, in, and inspires hope in everyone attending today. Would somebody please volunteer? For the closing prayer. Oh, Rich. Thank thanks, you. Rich. Our dear Father in heaven, we are humbled to be gathered here this day as thy children. We are honored, Father, to be given this opportunity to partake of the atonement of Jesus Christ. We are humbled to be here as support for one another and to share of our own experience, our experience of the atonement of Jesus Christ in our own lives. Father, we do pray that there may be a protection upon those in this group and upon those within the sound of our voices this night. We do pray that they may all have the armies of heaven to surround them, to build them up and to strengthen them, to provide the strength that they need to face their own challenges and trials and recoveries. Father, we do thank Thee for the opportunity to be here on this earth as Thy children, learning, growing, and struggling to become what Thou would have us to be, to reach the measure of our creation, Father. We do pray and thank Thee for these things, 
we acknowledge thy hand in our lives and bringing us together and to those that will share of this experience with us. We do say these things, Father, acknowledging thy hand in total gratitude to thee. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You have been listening to an actual LDS Addiction Recovery Meeting. For more information or to attend meetings near you, visit arp.lds.org or contact your local priesthood leader. To download a podcast of any episode of the 12-Step Addiction Recovery Program, visit mormonchannel.org or arp.lds.org.